Today on Inspired Money. Whether you're selling drugs or you're in organized crime and you're doing extortion or um, espionage where you're committing treason against your country, but you're, most of the time people aren't doing it for some ideological reason. They're doing it for money. So that concept of people being so greedy, so in want of money that they're willing to commit a crime is, 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 to me, it's just fascinating. This is episode 72 with retired FBI agent, author, and podcaster, Jerry Williams. Welcome to Inspired Money. My name is Andy Wong, a managing partner at Runnymede Capital Management. Each week, we bring you an interesting person to help you get inspired, shift your perspectives on money, and achieve incredible things. From making it to giving it away, inspired money means making a difference, creating something bigger than oneself, and maybe, just maybe, making the world a better place. Thank you for joining me. Hey, Inspired Money Maker, welcome back. If it's your first time listening, welcome. Inspired Money is different from other personal finance podcasts because we don't want to just learn how to live with money. We want to put money in a positive light to inspire ourselves to live richer lives, make a greater impact, and together, make the world a better place. Thank you so much for joining me on this mission. Today, we're talking to Jerry Williams, a retired FBI agent. And I have to tell you, I'm pretty excited about today's show because as a kid, I spent a lot of time watching FBI movies, FBI shows, and carrying around an FBI badge. I thought it would be really interesting to hear her views about money because she's specialized in cases targeting major economic crime and corruption. She writes this on her homepage, With a gun, you can steal hundreds. With a pen, you can steal millions. Jerry has received numerous awards throughout her career, including four United States Attorney Awards for Distinguished Service. You might recognize her from CNBC's American Greed, where she was interviewed in the episode Confessions of a Con Man. Jerry also produces and hosts the extremely popular podcast FBI Retired Case File Review, a true crime podcast where she interviews other retired FBI agents about their high-profile cases and careers, corrects cliches and misconceptions about the FBI, and recommends crime fiction. And she also writes her own crime fiction inspired by actual true crime FBI cases. In this episode, you'll learn how the FBI works and why Jerry loved fighting fraud, some tips for protecting yourself from becoming a victim of fraud or identity theft, and the fine line between good and bad. Now let's get inspired with Jerry Williams. Jerry, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Let's jump right in. What's your earliest childhood memory of money? Well, I knew you were going to ask this question, so I thought about it. And it may not be the earliest one, but I think it's one that made the biggest impact on me. And that's when when I was probably around 10 years old. I, I know I went shopping with my mother, and I purchased something, and the cashier gave me the wrong change back. She gave me more than I should have gotten. And I remember being very excited as I walked away saying, you know, she gave me, you know, $5 more than I was supposed to get. And my mother turned around, (laughs) turned me around and and made me go back and and tell the, the cashier and give the money back. I remember that very, very well. And you know, later on in my career as a, you know, white collar crime, economic crime investigator, you know, the fact that I was made to give back money that didn't belong to me uh, is uh, kind of <laughs> ironic, don't you think? Yeah, a little bit of foreshadowing, maybe. Or at least it, it you know, helped form you to land yeah. on the right side of the law. Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely a powerful life lesson. That is great. So you've been retired from the FBI, I think, for 10 years. Yes, which is amazing to me. That is amazing. (laughs) 10 years, yeah. And you're a very busy woman. Can we start with this? How did a psychology major become a juvenile probation officer and eventually become an FBI special agent? 
Yeah, it's a good question. When I went to college, I was, as you said, a psychology major, but I really wanted to become a psychiatrist. So I took all of those courses, you know, the chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, all of those courses in order to go to medical school. But when I graduated, you know, I took a year off and I uh, went to Switzerland. I had, I was, uh, I got an American exchange uh, grant to go to Switzerland for a year to study. And when I came back, I just wasn't that interested in going to medical school anymore. And so I was looking for a place to use my psychology degree. And in most jobs uh, in psychology, you're going to have to have an advanced degree, at least a master's, if not a PhD. And of course, you know, I, I didn't have that. But I found this position and it was a juvenile probation officer, but the the title was aftercare counselor. So for my particular job in probation, I got all the kids that had been sent away to reform school. And so part of my job was to travel all through Virginia to visit them at these different group homes or institutions. And then when they came back to Newport News, Virginia, where I was based, I was the person who was supposed to guide them and counseling them as they re-entered into the community, you know, make sure they adjusted with school or if they were going to be working and, you know, how, how they fit in with their family. And so even though I was very young at the time, you know, I started that job when I was probably 22, 23, I was actually counseling. I learned counseling um, methods and techniques and therapies to work with these kids and their parents. And so it really was a, a good fit for a psychology major. I heard you once say that you loved that job. What did you love about it? I love the kids. I mean, even bad kids are, are fun to be around. I mean, you just, you know, kids are just, you know, just uh, such bright people with so many ideas and less filters. You know, they just say what they want to say and, you know, and, and, and again, don't have any filters. And I really enjoyed that. They were funny. They made me laugh. But it also was a very difficult job because, you know, these were young people that had already started turning in the wrong direction. And to help them course correct was very difficult. I mean, I was young myself, which in a way was an, an advantage, but also was a disadvantage because I was basically a fill-in parent, and I didn't know how to parent anybody. Um, so it was a great job because I was around kids, and I enjoyed being around them. But it was also a very difficult job in the fact that I was burning myself out quickly. I was there for three years, and I gave so much to those kids. And you know, it was disturbing um, you know, in the middle of the night to get a call and find out that they'd been arrested or you know, had done something wrong. It, you know, it, I just knew that I wasn't going to last long. Yeah, it sounds like there was very much an element of social work there. Oh, absolutely. Which is very taxing and, and difficult emotionally. Yeah, and, and one of the things I noticed, and this is not, you know, a, a negative dig on the probation officers, the, the, more, the veterans that had been there for a long, long time, but I saw them being less emotional, much more distant, um, with the kids. And I guess that is what you have to do to protect yourself in that job. But I wasn't really excited about continuing to work in that field and having that disconnect, you know, from the kids either. So I understand that it's not a case where your lifelong dream as a child was to become an FBI agent. So how did you end up there? Yeah, that's the truth. So many people that I meet and that I talk to on, on my podcast, you know, say they had always wanted to be an FBI agent. I, it was like the furthest thing away from my life goals. Uh, I, I ended up there because I saw a newsletter that said that the FBI was looking for women and minorities. And I was very attracted with the by the salary, too. I was making, this was years ago. This was in, in uh, the early 80s. And I was making about $14,000 a year as a probation officer. And the starting salary for the agent position was 28000 So I would double my salary. So I will be honest in saying that the initial interest I had, what really 
tweaked you know, my curiosity was the salary. But then I made a call to the local FBI office to talk to the recruiter, and he really sold me on the job, on on the almost social work aspects of the FBI position. Hmm. So he knew which buttons to push, it sounds like. Yeah, he did. He knew I was a psychology major. He knew I was a probation officer. And he really skillfully showed me on that, on that phone call, that, that, uh, that first phone call, how my skills would transfer you know, almost seamlessly into the FBI special agent position. Interesting. And not only was it a pay increase from your job at that time to becoming a special agent, but the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the pay is also better in a federal job than a local law enforcement, isn't it? Oh, definitely. I mean, you start off, you know, uh, in, in a salary, you know, that is competitive, say, with teachers or probation officers now or, you know, but as you grow in the job, um, the the salary I think is is very very competitive with a lot of professional positions. I mean, you're you're definitely making more than a teacher or you know a manager in retail. You know, by the time you've been in the FBI for say six or seven years, you're doing pretty well, I think. And you were part of an economic fraud squad. You're an expert in Ponzi schemes, fraud, corruption. My guess is that. You've seen how money can bring out the worst in people. Given your years of experience in the job that you served, what does money mean to you? You know, that's, that's a great question. I respect money. I am not one that has ever wanted to be rich, but I've always wanted to be able to have enough money to do the things that I'd like to do. You know, I like to travel. Uh, I like to, you know, read and be entertained. And and so I would like to have enough money to do that. But I've never wanted to be, you know, filthy rich. I, I don't envy people that I see who are filthy rich, because I think in the long run, money doesn't make you happy. You know, relationships and people and, and loved ones is what makes you happy. And And I can tell you, I am rich when it comes to that. Well, that's for sure. Especially now in retirement, You're talking to so many people with your podcast, you're an author. But before we get to that stuff, you kind of fell into the uh, white-collar crime area. But it sounds like it suited you really well because of your background in psychology. And can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. When you get into the FBI, your initial assignment is based on the needs of the Bureau. I mean, that's something that's drilled into you all the time, the needs of the Bureau. You are a body. And if they need a body over here, then that's where you're going. And so, um, you know, everybody in the FBI kind of starts out some doing background investigations and bank robberies. Uh, At least that's what they used to do. And then when you kind of feel your way around in those areas and learn the basics of an investigation, you know, you're sent to a squad. And I was sent to a government fraud squad. And, uh, you know, I worked out for a little bit, and uh, that was in Sacramento, California. Then I was transferred to Philadelphia, and I ended up on an economic crime squad. And I really enjoyed it. I I never had a desire other than to be to work public corruption, but I never had a desire to work anything else because, you know, the FBI works organized crime and drugs and espionage and terrorism. You know, it's an endless, over more than 200 violations. But once I got into or was assigned to work fraud, I really enjoyed it. I, I think I enjoyed the mind games because when you're working fraud, you're working against a con artist, someone who always believes that they're the smartest person in the room. And it's kind of fun to kind of go man against man or woman against man or woman against woman, you know, with them as I try to figure out what they've done and gather the evidence to to prove it. So is there an element of a cat and mouse game there? Absolutely, Be, especially in fraud and, and, and most other crime, you know that the crime has occurred. And most of the time, what the investigator is doing is proving who did that crime. When it comes to fraud, 
you know who did it. But whether or not this was a fraud as opposed to, say, a contract dispute, you know, or, you know, a civil disagreement is what you need to prove. And that is just, it's so cerebral. It's so, it, it, it involves all of the, uh, you know, to, to have all of your, your energy directed at looking at documents and talking to people, just trying to figure out what is the deception, because that's what fraud is. Fraud is when you gain something of value based on a lie or a deception. And so what you're trying to prove is that what that person did, what they said was a lie or was, you know, a a deception. And I really enjoy that. So over I don't know how long you were at the Bureau. Was it 28 some years? 26. 26 years. The more experience that you gain, seeing more con men and con women at work, identifying and understanding their tricks, their techniques, their tactics, is it really advanced or does it all go back to the age old fear and greed that is in all of us? I, I don't think it I don't think it ever gets advanced. I think it always is just that element of greed. And and really, you know, I'm talking mainly about fraud, but in almost every type of crime that the FBI investigates, it has that element of greed. Whether you're selling drugs or you're in organized crime and you're doing extortion or um espionage where you're committing treason against your country, but you're, most of the time, people aren't doing it for some ideological reason. They're doing it for money. So that concept of people being so greedy, so in want of money that they're willing to commit a crime is, is, is to me, is just fascinating. So it sounds like you've done a lot of things in your role as a special agent because um, you were mentioning that when you first joined you're just a body. You don't know where you're going to be sent. And over time, you became more specialized in financial fraud. But still, it it required you to be out in the field, but also in the office, like combing through documents, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and that's one of the things that whenever I talk to somebody who's interested in the FBI and, and they talk about a different, you know, a specialty that they'd like to do. I also, I always make sure they understand that even if you're working that specialty, even though I worked economic crime, you know, if there was a a drug arrest or, you know, some type of a a big raid that was going down and the office needed bodies, there we go again with the bodies, um, you know, you went. So, yeah, I was on an economic fraud squad and uh, I still did all the other things that uh, you know any other agent would do, as far as make arrests and you know go on searches and stay up all night on surveillances. You know, I did all of that. You know, we all do. So, what was your favorite part about the job? I, definitely meeting the people, and uh, I think if you were to you know listen to the podcast all of the agents say the same thing and when we, and when we talk about meeting the people we're not just talking about you know the victims and the witnesses we're actually talking about our subjects too and many of us you know have uh, you know we're able to to develop uh interesting relationships with the people that we were actually investigating and eventually you know help put in jail Yeah, I've enjoyed listening to some of your podcast episodes, and I was impressed by uh, many of your podcast guests, the special agents, talking about how, in many cases, they do still have contact with the criminals that they were chasing. I just recently, with last month, I went to one of the local universities with a former uh, subject of mine, and we did a presentation on business to business telemarketing fraud together. Uh, <laughs> so he he went away to jail. He he ended up having to go to jail for a year and a day for uh, being involved in a multi million dollar business to business telemarketing fraud. But he uh, we became I wouldn't say friends, but definitely friendly. 
And uh, recently, you know, I, I had him on my podcast, and uh, um, we're going to start doing more of our uh, conversations on the road about, you know, fraud. It's a collaboration. It takes two sides. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think people were fascinated by it, and uh, you know, I, I enjoy doing it. I, it's more of a a warning, you know, how not to get scammed. And he tells, I tell it on my side, and he tells it on his side, and uh, I I think it's fascinating. Can we dig a little bit into that? Because speaking for myself, I know that I get a lot of. Uh, scam telemarketing calls every day. Yeah, I get them too. <laughs> I mean, some are robo calls. Other, there's another live person on the line. But um, it just seems like I'm getting inundated. I mean, it seems to be increasing, not decreasing. Oh, absolutely. I love the one where it is a person who's calling from, quote unquote, your credit card company. Well, if you're calling from my credit card company, then how come you don't know the name of it? You know, or they'll say, I'm calling from Visa MasterCard. Well, those are two different companies, you know, <laughs> uh, it, it, and it's amazing to me. Well, I shouldn't say amazing to me that people fall for it. You know, that's why, you know, con artists do what they do because people do, uh, you know, they're not thinking, they're, they're not present and, you know, they do fall for, you know, some of these tricks and scams. Yeah, it's very true. They do catch you even if you are well-educated, you have your guard up, but your guard is not up all the time. And inevitably, anybody is susceptible. If you're busy or you're going through something, you're just, you know, your guard's down just for a moment. Yeah, I actually, I, I'm going to admit this, that I almost fell for it. I got an email and it was from iTunes. And, you know, for all of us who have Apple products, you know, you have, because of apps, you have on file your credit card number so that you can make purchases through your Apple products. And it was an email from iTunes saying that they were going to renew my annual subscription. Uh, unless, you know, just a notice saying that they were going to renew my annual uh, subscription, unless, of course, I wanted to, you know, cancel it. And if I did, you know, to please insert, you know, my... Uh, my account number so that they could uh, cancel the annual subscription. And I started filling it out. And then I realized, wait a minute, what are they taught? Annual subscription. And I stopped myself and I really was so close into giving them my account number and password because of this sense of urgency that the email created. That, you know, if, if, if I didn't immediately let them know to cancel it, that they were going to renew the subscription. And I almost fell for it. And, you know, and afterwards, I'm, you know, like <laughs> shaking my head like, okay, so that's how it works. That's what they do. You know, that, that false sense of urgency that if you don't do this now, then this will happen is the reason that many people do fall for these scams. So what kind of advice do you give people? Is that... Number one, like slow down, take your time, think about it. Absolutely, slow down. And if you get an email from anyone that says that they're, you know, your 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 account of anything, whether it's a, you know your credit card or your bank, don't respond to the email. You already you know who your account is with. Go to your 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 online account and see if there is a communication from your company there about the same thing. And if there isn't, then forget about it. You know, it's it's a fraud. But never respond directly to any email that you get from your your uh, any of your accounts. Go directly to your your account yourself and and see what kind of notices are there. Right. And when in doubt, just hang up the phone and call your banking institution or whoever it may be. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that uh, the IRS always likes to say, because, you know, we're going to start getting those calls soon, is the IRS is never going to call you. <laughs> they're never going to call you or they're never going to ask you to provide your account information over the phone. So whether it's you know through email or whether it's through the phone, don't give anybody your personal information. You contact them 
and provide it. That's great advice. You know, hopefully more people will, um, you know, heed it. And one of the things about fraud that is so frustrating is when people are defrauded, most of the time they they're so embarrassed that they don't report it. So we really have no idea how many frauds are out there. It's estimated that less than 5% of frauds are actually reported. So if, let's say I did fall for that iTunes uh, uh, fraud and they did take, you know, uh, they charged up uh, 100 or 200 or $300 worth of apps and, you know, iTunes, you know, files uh, on my credit card. Most of the time, you know, someone who falls for a scam like that are just going to say, hey, that's the cost of uh, me being stupid and not even report it. So there are so many scams that are going on and so much money that's being generated, billions of dollars being generated that law enforcement really doesn't even know about because people are too embarrassed to admit it. Yeah, it's a great point. And interestingly, I think as the world is getting smaller and smaller, I mean, this is a global issue. The Federal Bureau, right, is domestically focused. Oftentimes, the hackers or the criminals, the people who are stealing identities, they can be anywhere in the world. When you're talking about someone who's defrauded, if they're not too embarrassed, who do they call? Well, actually, there is a internet web page that the FBI asks anybody who's been defrauded, you know, especially through the internet to contact, and it's IC3. So, and I'm trying to remember what the what the three C's are, <laughs> but computer, crime, uh, I can't remember, I'm sorry, but IC3. So, if you went to www.ic3.com or possibly .org, you would be able to get to that site, and that's where you would, uh, you know, complete the form to let uh, the FBI know you've been defrauded. Coming up, we talk about how the FBI prepared Jerry to be an entrepreneur, the differences between good guys and bad guys, her mission to tell the public more about the FBI. But first, Jerry sets me straight. And I do want to correct you on one thing. Even though the FBI works in the United States, if the victim, if the crime occurred here, if the victim is here in the United States, it doesn't matter where in the world the fraudster is. You know, we're investigating that. So whether they're in, you know, hackers in, in, in Russia or hackers are in India or, or China, if, the, if an American citizen or, or, some, or the fraud has occurred here in the United States, then the FBI is definitely the agency that is, you know, pursuing that international fraud. Mm, that's also good to know. The show notes for this episode can be found at inspiredmoney.fm forward slash 072. If you're listening in your car or wherever you are, check the show notes if you want to learn more about Jerry or things mentioned in this episode. It's time for the Runnymede Money Tip of the Week. According to an annual Fidelity Investment Survey, nearly one-third of Americans plan to make money resolutions for 2019. Have you considered making a resolution or a money resolution? According to the survey, 48% of people plan to save more, 29% aim to pay down debt, and 15% aspire to spend less. Here are four quick things that you might consider. Number one, evaluate last year's financial mistakes. Take an honest look at your finances last year. Did you overspend, overborrow? Where were you lacking? Reconsider your financial mistakes and strive to implement changes to improve this year. Number two, commit to no spend days. Try doing this one. Enlist a partner or friend to commit to one no-spend weekend or no-spend day per month. Make it a game where no money leaves your hands or bank account for the day. You can eat at home, brown bag it, find free entertainment or activities, and skip shopping. Number three, boost retirement contributions. If you're looking to save more for retirement, commit to increasing your 401k contributions. If your company offers a matching contribution, at the very least, make sure that you're contributing enough to your plan to secure your employer's match. Oftentimes, this is between 3 and 6%. 
Number three, identify your financial goals. Before you can make progress toward your financial goals, identify what they are. Are you hoping to buy a home, repay debt, invest more? One way to increase your chances of success a lot is that you have to be specific. Write down your goals for the year, set a plan, and check your progress at regular intervals. Make adjustments as needed. Try one or more of these tactics and see what difference it can make come year end. That's the Runnymede Money Tip of the Week. Inspired Money is brought to you by Runnymede Capital Management. We help you to plan, invest, and worry less. What's your biggest financial challenge right now? Do you need help consolidating old accounts, reviewing your asset allocation or risk? We can help. Email me at awang at runnymede.com. That's R-U-N-N-Y-M-E-D-E dot com. Or go to inspiredmoney.fm forward slash Andy. I'd love to hear from you. And we can even schedule a short call since it can be easier to talk money. You're listening to Inspired Money. I'm Andy Wong. Jerry, I'm not sure how aware you are of this, but I've been looking into different cases of identity theft or where people have a Snapchat account hacked or something like that. And I heard a story about how the hackers use a technique where they call your mobile phone provider uh, and, and port your phone number to their phone. And it's because of two-factor authentication that we all use. Like the cell phone has become the gateway that can either protect our information or it becomes like a backdoor where a hacker, if they can convince Verizon, for example, that they are me and change my phone number to their phone, suddenly they can start resetting passwords for different accounts and they can use the cell phone to verify. Have you, have you seen that? No, I haven't. Um, but it doesn't surprise me. Um, there's always a, a, a new scam or you know a new scheme being uh, created and perpetrated every time you turn around. But that <laughs> one, that one's a new one. I haven't, I haven't heard of that one yet. Yeah, I don't know how prevalent it is, but I, I heard stories where they said that's what the hackers did, and that's how they were able to get into people's, you know, social media accounts and things like that to steal their usernames. And the topic's always frightening, but that one was a little bit ironic because um, the journalist who was covering the story was saying that what you have to do is protect your cell phone number. Like, don't give your cell phone number out. But the irony is that we give it out to everybody. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. I mean, that's the whole purpose of having a cell phone and cell phone number is to people to be able to contact you and 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 to reach out to you so uh i don't know if that is a good defense <laughs> you know not not giving it out well something for listeners to think about it sounds like not prevalent but at least something to be aware of and hopefully the uh the telecom providers are upping their game in making sure that they're talking to their customers and not a fraudster you know, and talking about this, this is has nothing to do with uh, financial fraud. But you know, I had that happen to me. Somebody created a Twitter account in my name, and I don't understand what the purpose of that was. And so I actually had people who were, uh, you know, following me or following who they thought was me, and it was it was a whole different jerry williams account with my picture the same picture that i was using uh, that i use on twitter but somebody else had had created a whole different account and i never understood why they did it i was able to contact twitter and and provide not only did i have to provide information about who i was but i had to give them proof of of my identity of of and I'm, I can't remember how I was able to do that, but you know, I think I had to send them um, like an, an envelope with a, a a bill in my name, and just I had to prove that I was the right Jerry Williams, so that they would delete the uh, deactivate the account that was in my name. But it was so strange, you know? Why? What was the purpose of somebody doing that? And subsequently, they did not give you your blue check mark. 
No, they did not. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought that was the purpose for it, that, the, that it, you know, after that happening, that that's why they would issue you a verified account, since they no, went through the verification. I know you would think so, but no, they just, you know, I was, I'm okay with that. Um, you know, I'm not one of those people who I could care less how many people are, are following me um, on Twitter or Instagram or, or Facebook. Uh, I make myself available and I think I put out some interesting, you know, social media posts and tweets and things like that. So if you enjoy it, good. And if you don't, um, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, you know, they deactivated the account and that's all I wanted. Jerry, you're quote unquote retired. But I see you doing, it looks like, a thousand things. I view you as like a 21st century entrepreneur in that you're an author. You started a podcast so that you could build an audience um, to sell books. And you're very creative. How did working for the FBI prepare you to have this entrepreneurial mindset? Well, I would say that every single special agent in the FBI is, in a sense, an entrepreneur. Because we, and a lot of people don't understand this, that in the FBI, you're given a case to investigate. It is assigned to you. You may have uh, 15 cases. You may have 25 cases. They're all assigned to you. Nobody is looking over your shoulder, telling you what to do or how to do it. Every 90 days, 90 days, three months, a supervisor will ask you to bring in your cases and he'll flip through them or she'll flip through them and see you know, what you're doing. But otherwise, you are on your own to make decisions about when you need to be at work, what kind of resources you need, what kind of manpower you need. So say I need to do a search. It is up to me to figure out, working with the United States Attorney's Office, what I need to obtain during that search, and then how many people that I need. You know, what kind of resources do I need to bring boxes? Do I need a, a, a computer analyst with me? I, it's my decision as the case agent. I have an entrepreneurial hold on that information, on that case. It is mine to figure out everything else about. And, you know, Sometimes you need to be creative in order to accomplish uh, what you need in, 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 in uh, proving a case. And uh, it, it really becomes your responsibility, very um, self-motivating in order to, to get that work done. Definitely also in, in the last five years of my career, I got the opportunity to be the spokesperson for the Philadelphia office. So I was in charge of the whole talking to the media, talking to the public about what the Philadelphia FBI was doing. And that also meant using my creative, uh, you know, the creative parts of my brain in order to make that experience for, for the media and for the public very interesting. So people always say that not everybody's built to be an entrepreneur. Similarly, do you think that applies to special agents of the FBI? Yeah, it could be, because there are many agents who may not be a case agent. They may be working on a squad that is more of a um, uh, ensemble <laughs> uh, situation, say, for instance, a member of a joint terrorism task force where you know the whole task force has a common goal or, you know, or, or an organized crime squad where you have a the subject of your of your squad you know are these heads of organizations and everybody who works on the squad has a little piece of you know what they're supposed to do in order to take down that criminal enterprise and so for those people who don't want to run a case who don't want to be in charge of an investigation, there are places for them too. I mean, most of the people who come into the FBI are leaders, are people who have shown that they had the capability of leading. But, you know, you can't have a whole organization full of leaders. And so some people uh, enjoy, you know, that, that being a part of a team and working on a team investigation. Uh, and, and, and that's great, too. 
Yeah, I'm just amazed at the autonomy and yeah. sort of decentralized way that the whole thing works. Yeah, it is. Now, the bigger the case, uh, then it is very centralized. You know, when it comes to terrorism cases, you know, a lot of those have worked, you know, right from headquarters, knowing exactly, you know, FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C., knowing exactly what's going on and, and what offices and, and what agents are doing what so that they're not, you know, duplicating effort or, you know, crossing over and, and you know, and contaminating e each other's investigation. But there are other cases that don't need that type of, uh, of oversight. And yeah, when you're working one of those cases, like, you know, I did most of my career, I, I'm in charge. You know, I go to my supervisor when I need resources or, or help. Um, but most of the time, if once you become a veteran agent, you know, you know what you're doing and you just do it. I think that your background is really unique in that you majored in psychology, your experience as a special agent, but it's really that psychological part because now that you're an author, you really try to get into the mind of both the criminal and the special agent. How fine a line is there between the good guy and the bad guy? Oh, I think that at times the line is very, very, very thin. There are some people who can go right up to the edge and because of their own moral compass or because they're scared of going to jail, <laughs> they don't cross the line. And there are some people that they see the prize, you know, that financial gain, that greed, that's all they see and they don't even see the line. But for, for me... I am just fascinated at the things that people will do in order to steal other people's money. That's always fascinated me. You know, even with, with the kids that I had on my, my caseload when I was a probation officer, just fascinated that these kids, you know, went that step. You know, I had one, one, one kid, one, one uh, teenager that love to break into people's houses. You know, he would break into the houses sometimes when the people were home and sneak through their house and looking for stuff. And, you know, when I was talking to him, I could just see it was like somebody who enjoys roller coasters, riding roller coasters. He got such a high of being inside that house, you know, in the dark, going through people's things and trying to find treasures, which for him, you know, were money or, or things that he could sell later, you know, for money. When I say that, I know that I've talked to agents who have worked undercover and they get some of that same adrenaline, that same, you know, urge uh, or, 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 you know, spike of, of, of energy from working undercover. They're doing something good, but just that, that scariness, that, that on the edge is something that they enjoy too, on two different sides of that line, but, you know, still getting that same type of, uh, of, of uh, adrenaline and charge from it. Uh, that to me is fascinating, and, and that is definitely what I write about. My books, and I have two so far, I'm, I'm working on a third right now, are more about what's going on inside both my agent who's investigating and, and my bad guy. So I do multiple personalities uh, or points of view in, in my book. So you, you're, you're, you're watching what the, what's going on with the, the bad guy while you're also watching and listening to what's going on with uh, my special agent, Carrie Wheeler. Uh, the, all of my books are, are going to be in a series, uh, a Philadelphia Corruption Squad series, and, and that's really what I'm into. It's, yeah, I, there is a, um, a great saying that was by Joseph Wambaugh, who is considered the father of police procedurals, and he said that a good crime novel is not about how cops work on cases, but how cases work on cops. I love that. Me too. 
Me too. So I like to ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you define success? Hmm. <laughs> That's a good question. It's not financially, you know. <laughs> it's not financially, but it's definitely out of I'm, – I'm very competitive, uh, and I think a lot of agents are are very competitive. You know, wanting to be successful, there is definitely a culture in the FBI of accomplishment, and uh, you know, so I I don't want to say that it is by comparing myself to others because I don't think that's true at all. I I don't think I really that's, but in knowing that I am working hard that I'm doing my best, that I'm being creative, that I am uh, using all of my, um, my skills in order to accomplish something. When I know that uh, you know, I'm doing that, I, I think that's, that's when I see success. That's success. Yeah, and if I may go back to something earlier that you said in this conversation, it's about relationships Mm, yeah, and absolutely. In trying to prepare for speaking with you, I also noticed that you're on this mission doing something that's bigger than yourself. You are on a mission to tell people what the FBI is, what it does, and trying to dispel a lot of myths and misconceptions, too. Yes, absolutely. So I will be, <laughs> I'll be honest, when I first started my podcast, I started it, FBI Retired, Case File Review, to interview retired agents as a way to introduce myself to people that would might be interested in reading books about the FBI. I thought, well, if I can get people interested who, if I can reach people through my podcast that are interested in hearing FBI stories, then maybe they will also be interested in reading my FBI stories. And so I started my podcast in January January of 2016, so almost three years ago. And as we all know, later that fall, uh, you know, right around the election, that's when our director at the time, James Comey, had an unprecedented uh, press conference where he announced uh, that he would not be uh, investigating Hillary Clinton, and he made some unbelievable comments about her and about the investigation, which is something the FBI never does. Because, again, I was a spokesperson, trained spokesperson with the FBI for my last five years. And, you know, if we're not going to investigate a case, then it's usually that decision is made by the United States Attorney's Office, the federal prosecutors, and may, they make those announcements. The FBI never does that. So in making this announcement, uh, we got thrown into the political climate. We got thrown into a, a political mess. And that's the public, some parts of the public, began to say negative things about the FBI's independence and the FBI's integrity. And that's, I just, as a former agent, as a retired agent, and as a former spokesperson, it just made me so angry that people would be thinking that FBI or FBI agents would be political in nature, that the whole mindset of my podcast, you know, I, I didn't have to change the way I was doing it, but my whole purpose of doing it uh, changed and it became, as you said, a mission to let these interviews with retired agents about some of the Bureau's biggest cases and some fascinating cases that people have never heard about. I want to let those interviews speak for the FBI. You know, I don't need to get out there and <laughs> defend it in any way. Just listen to the type of work, the type of commitment that the dedication that these agents have, and then I want you to let me know whether you really question the independence and integrity of the FBI. Your podcast is so good. I, I urge all the Inspired Money listeners to check out FBI Retired Case File Review. It's such great stories. It's entertaining. It's informative. You learn something, and you do get some insight into how the FBI operates. So thank you so much for 
spending time with us today, sharing your story and educating us about things to look out for and how to protect ourselves from financial fraud. Can you tell the Inspired Money listener where they can find your podcast, your books, and follow you? Yes. Uh, so I have my own website, jerrywilliams.com. That's J-E-R-R-I williams.com. And you can access uh, you know, information about my books and the podcast there. The podcast is everywhere. As a matter of fact, I'm one of the lucky few that has now uh, has my podcast on Pandora, Spotify, you know, Apple, Google, all, all of the, uh, uh, you know, major podcast catchers i'm on uh, fbi retired is 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 on those now so you can uh, um you can uh, listen to it there but my books i'm definitely pushing my books i think uh they all have a financial or, or greed component to it they're both uh based on actual fbi cases that i fictionalized so i think your audience would enjoy those because they do have a a financial um uh, spin to it. Uh, but uh, I'm also on Twitter, Jerry Williams One, and Instagram, Jerry Williams One. And I have a f- author Facebook page, Jerry Williams Author. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jerry. Thank you. It has been fantastic. And I had a chance to listen to several of your interviews because, again, I, I, I do have an uh, uh, economic fraud background and ec- I'm interested in economics and finances. So I think I'll also become a, uh, a follower of yours, too. Thank you. Thank you for listening. As you know, that is like the highest compliment you can give any podcaster, that someone will listen to your show. Absolutely. So what was your favorite Inspired Money moment? Good versus evil? What people will do for the want of money? I like that even with Jerry's very interesting perspectives on money, for her, it still comes down to this. She never really wanted to be rich, but wanted to have enough to do the things that she enjoys, like traveling and reading books. She's never envied filthy rich people because, as she puts it, money doesn't make you happy people and connections do. And with that considered, she is indeed rich. If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment and takeaway, let me know by going to inspiredmoney.fm forward slash Facebook. Let's continue the conversation there. If you like Inspired Money, leave us a review at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. I read them all and it makes my day. Tell a friend about the show, grab their phone, subscribe them, and tell them to listen to your favorite episode. I'm really excited about the new year. Let's make it great together. Thank you so much for listening. The music you're listening to right now and all other music on today's show is by the amazing Jim Kimo West. Aloha, Kimo. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens.